Hannah Hillman, and welcome to the show. Joining me today are filmmakers Thomas Nudy and Trishal Tajasvi from Arensis Films. Thank you both for joining me. Thank you, Ariana. You're welcome. Thank you. How did you both get interested in film? Well, actually, I remember watching Who Framed Roger Rabbit, and that kind of solidified live action filmmaking for me. But before that, I was like obsessed with cartoons, commercials, anything on that television screen I was obsessed with. Um, I think uh, my mom didn't like to tell me I was obsessed with it until I got my first like job. Then she was like, okay, now I'll tell you how obsessed you were when you were a kid. When I was a teenager, I, was, I didn't know like what a director was or a filmmaker. I just saw the actors on screen. I thought they were the people making the stories. So I got obsessed with being an actor. Then I found out stuntmen were doing the, the scenes and the, the cool scenes. So I was like, I need to be a stuntman. So like I'm 11 or 12, I'm, like, I'm jumping off stuff, thinking that's how you make films. Then I find out about writers and cinematographers. Uh, I saw, you know, they say ASC at the end of cinematographers' names. I thought that was like a degree. So I got obsessed with telling my mom, I'm going to get a, a camera degree. So I got really good at physics. Uh, then I found out you don't need a degree to become a filmmaker. So I dropped out of school. <laughs> and that's the story. <laughs> and how about you, Thomas? <laughs> Uh, I mean, it's it's not far off. I mean, it started when I was very young, and like I think you know, it's funny he mentions Who Framed Roger Rabbit as like live action, but of course it has animation in it, and he mentioned cartoons. I mean, that's where it began for me too. Um, but specifically, I remember like the day it came out, I was in the theater to see The Nightmare Before Christmas, and I was so fascinated with like the the style of animation, stop motion. And uh, I actually thought, like, they, I was like, who do they cast to get that skinny and that, like, short and fat? You know, I was an idiot little kid. Uh, I think I was four at the time. And so, you know, I was so fascinated by that. And so I got really into, like, film and animation. And, I mean, it, it just, it was born since then. You two are working together now. So how did you two start working together and how did you two meet? He was coming back from L.A. Uh, during his break, Christmas break, mm -hmm. uh, to make a short film. And he needed a camera. Uh, long, long story short, um, and he contacted me, and I said, I'll give you a discount. He sounded like a passionate guy. Uh, I went on set with a camera, and the DP, uh, Sebastian Barron, he had to leave halfway through for some issue. So he asked me to pick it up, and we kind of just worked well together. Actually, I remember like the first time he took us to a coffee shop, what was that, Big E's? Yeah, we did meet at Big E's, yeah. which is and no it was longer just like, in existence. It meant to be a 10 minute meeting, but we ended up sitting there for like two hours and we went to another bar. We just vibed, clicked. And it was good to, like I was in this area, like, um, and I've met a few guys that I thought were really passionate about film, but then when I went to see Thomas's bedroom, I was like, it's the first time I saw someone's bedroom that looked like mine back in England. You know, just posters, tons of film stuff. And I was like, there's another guy like this in Bradenton. I was like, okay. And we just had the same mentality about what film should be like and what art is. and everything like that. So, you both work together with Arensis Films now. How did Arensis Films as a whole come to be? So, when I came to America, I was like, I, it's a long story why I came to America, but I was here and I wasn't quite sure what I was doing. I didn't move here to make films, I moved here to get away from life in England. And my parents had a condo, so it kind of just worked out, I just sat there. I was like, I saw the filmmaking community here and I was like, okay, it's kind of interesting. It's like seems to be growing. And I was like, maybe I need to start a new company. Something I can just, a new identity. Something was fresh and everything. And then the name Arensis was always there since I was a, a teenager. I don't know where it came from, it just, it was there. So the name, I don't know where it came from. It just was there. But then I was talking to my friend Yanni, um, my, who's my partner in uh, Drift for Pictures, uh, about writing a script. And it was about a story where this guy's disillusioned with life and he gets a letter says, come back home. He comes back home and finds out his uh, sister, his brother-in-law, and his father have died in a car crash. And he starts to befriend his niece who's left over. And she writes this diary to her parents as if they're still alive. And it's like some fantastic imagination diary. And he calls it the Orensis Diaries. And we scrapped that project a long time ago. It wasn't going anywhere. And then after my sister passed away, I was here in America, and I thought, oh, Rensis, I like that name. Let's, let's, let's look into that. So I looked into the legality of it, whether someone else had used it, and I just broke the word down, and Oren, O-R-E-N, means forever in Hebrew, and then sis, sister. And it was like, click, it was like, we've got to use that name. And yeah, just pretty much stuck like that. And I didn't know what the company was about in the beginning. It was just a company, just to have an LLC, keep your liability away from me as a freelancer. And then over the last few years, I've started to grow, like 
Thomas came on board and we're getting other people coming on board now and now it's like the vision for the company is a lot more clear. It's like just support original visions. That's what the company's all about. Yeah, I mean, I remember like, you know, when he kind of won me over with the company's vision was when we were sitting on my patio um, late at night and, you know, we were talking about the short film that we had just shot um, and he, you know, kind of uh, compared Arensis to, you know, something like uh, the BBS company back in the 70s that was putting out like Easy Rider and stuff like that, you know, going back to making films for the sake of making films and not for the sake of making money. Um, you know, that's something you hope to come along to, of course, no one wants to be poor, but um, at the same time, you know, it's, it is about original vision and saying something new and expressing something that we haven't seen and we don't see on a, you know, weekly basis at the theater. And I think people want that now. People are getting tired of, people go watch this big tentpole, like, franchise film. Marvel, but, Star Wars. Yeah, everyone likes them, but people st are still hungry for something new. We've seen everything, and the problem with films right now is they're not coming from one, like, heart, you know? Like how books or any great story you know about comes from one place, one person's idea. And the films we're seeing now are amalgamations of what people want to see. We're not seeing films that people want to, you know, we're not sharing people's visions. We're not sharing people's dreams. We're sharing like a collection of weird, like, this makes money, this doesn't make money. Mm -hmm. So that's our goal is to try, bring back the 70s and, th and the 30s in Hollywood is also that prime era when people are just making films for the sake of making films. Do that with a sensibility that we will try and make money. Like, obviously, we want to make money. Like, I'd like a big house. Mm -hmm. And, um, yeah, trying to make money, but make good films at the same time. It's like, then why one wants to do, but. Mm -hmm. You know, I think the big thing that has been forgotten is the importance of script. You know, the importance of your story from the get-go, you know, and everyone's fascinated by the end product, and that's why we have producers who come in and take a script and say, well, that's, that's not for the audience. The audience doesn't want to see Iron Man die. You know, I don't know if he died, I haven't seen the last one, but like, you get what I'm saying. They come in and they destroy these stories and we've forgotten the originality of vision. We've forgotten that everything starts with the writer. Um, and that's not to give the writer any more credence than any other crew member on set, you know, that goes down to the gaffer, to the PA, you know. But at the same time, it does start with that singular vision of somebody who wants to say something. And I think artists these days have forgotten that, you know, the job is not far from being a prophet and saying something and communicating ideas and being able to take all the knowledge we've learned and relay it in a new way to modern society and hopefully they'll learn that, take something new and keep relaying it. Yeah, films are documenting dreams. That's what I look at, so. Okay, so you mentioned the Arances Diaries, which never really went anywhere. Mm -hmm. And you both talked about making films from your heart, basically. <laughs> are there any current projects that you're working on right now? Uh, I guess the biggest thing we're working on now is the Dreadtown documentary. That's been going for a few years now. A few? Yeah. Um, but yeah, now we're just like starting to really get to the end point. Uh, we're just raising finance for the post-production, which is a lot more expensive than we anticipated. It always is. Yeah. Because <laughs> you got to get rights for all the music and all the stock footage and then sound mixing. Um, yeah, the, the documentary is about a reggae band called Steel Pulse from the 1970s in England. Um, yeah, it's about a band that uh, went through prejudice in England with the police and the system. And you know, the music is very political and very charged, but at the same time, it's really fun to listen to. And it's a band that I didn't like reggae. I got into reggae music videos because my friend Yanni. I wasn't a big reggae fan, but obviously, after being around a lot of musicians and artists, it's like and now I really love reggae. And Steel Pulse was the first reggae band I actually liked. And I think that's why this documentary is going to be pretty important about for music. I think. So, along with current projects like Dreadtown, you've recently been working on Monty Comes Back. Do you want to talk a little about that? Thomas oh, yeah. wrote a script a couple <laughs> of years ago called Monty Comes Back. Mm -hmm. And he wanted to make it into a film. Uh, I read the script and I really liked it. I was just concerned about, is this... Some, it's not got any car chases or anything like that. And I was like, I was just concerned about, is this going to have a market? Yeah, budget was 15000 overall. Um, and yeah, we got an actor from New York called Brandon Tyler Jones. Who killed it. Yeah. An amazing actor. I mean, yeah. really amazing actor. And we had a lot of, I think there was 40 speaking roles, right? Or 40. I, I think there were like literally 49 roles in it. And I think, like, you're right, like, 42 or 43, we actually, like, had at least one line 
at least like one line that was integral. Which is, that was a challenge. When you think about like, a lot of low budget independent films have a small cast for a reason, because it's, you know, logical. This had 40, 40 roles in it, including uh, Chief O'Keefe, who's sitting in the back over there. Chief O'Keefe! Um, <laughs> and pr pretty much every actor in this area that um, we like. And let me, let me tell you how difficult in Florida, sorry, Florida it is to find older actors, good older actors. I mean, like, we found Surprising. young people. We found Not teenagers. Too. We had so many. The, the age of Monty was 27 years old, you know, and we're willing to work within that age gap. But we had so many 17, 18-year-old, 19-year-olds applying for the role in the area. It was amazing. Then as soon as you put out a call for, like, his parents, who are about 65, 70, three, it's like, come on, this is Florida. There's got to be more retired actors here, you know? Um, I guess all of them are hanging around the graveyards in L.A., but... Um, so, Monty is a semi-successful thespian who, uh, you know, found minor success um, by doing a one-man show early in his, uh, his life, uh, and he's working at a community theater, of all things, in Detroit when we find him at the first part of the film, uh, right before he has an immediate blow-up and kind of ruins everything that he has up there for himself. He verbally assaults his boss, his boss punches him in the face. Um, and he has no other real choice other than to come back to Florida under the pretense of being on a creative hiatus. So coming back, it's about the story of a, a man coming from a second coming of age, just finding himself again and learning to appreciate family and the things that are important in life. It's basically knocking his delusions out. And the film is like a really sweet, funny drama about this young man. He's a real and, jerk. Um, that's what I loved about the script is this anti-hero. I love anti-heroes. And like, it doesn't play to the conventions of this guy needs to do this or that. It'd be like, the conflict isn't as obvious as you think it is. It's not on the surface. It's not like, oh, I've lost my job, I need to get another one. It's not about that. The, the conflict is something more internal and real. And I think people are really gonna enjoy it because it's funny, plus it has something to say. And for I think this area is gonna be really proud of the film. Once, it come, once we're done with the edit and we put it out there, I think people are gonna really be impressed by what we did for $15,000. It looks like $150,000. Yeah, it looks good. Looks pretty good. We had, a, we had the best team in the area. Mm -hmm. That's what we had. Well, I'm looking forward to it. Mm -hmm. And along with your own personal projects, you've recently, recently been collaborating with students at Bob Gray's DVP course. Do you want to talk about that? Nah. No. Yeah, no. no. They're not cool enough? No, nah, those kids no. aren't cool. <laughs> well, I mean, you know, uh, Bob Gray contacted Trishel and, you know, uh, was like, hey, could you come and do, like, a lecture or a workshop or something? And Trishel called me, and we were, it was just going to be, like, a one-day thing, but then we figured that, you know, why not extend this, you know? Um, and so we ended up, you know, coming in every, you know, you know how often we came in, every Friday, most often. Um, to just kind of talk to you guys about what it is to be filmmakers and like how you're gonna have to do it and you know what you should do, I guess, but also to workshop scripts with you and develop them and uh, bring them to fruition. And we shot one of them that Trishel directed and I produced that Taylor Teague, AKA Megan Teague wrote. Um, and now, and we started shooting Overcooked, but um, by Viviana Lopez, but we're looking to readjust that. Nonetheless, we have because we were rushing into it. We are trying to get a deadline for the Sarasota Film Festival. Uh, but then we realized we're rushing the films, we're compromising the films. And the whole point when we came to the class was trying to teach the students how to make an indie film, the indie process. Um, no, and that's something I don't think a lot of film schools really touch on, is like how to make an independent film. How do you work in that uh, world where there's no rules in terms of like union, like 12 hour days or 10 hour days? Um, and how do you work with no budget? How do you get actors interested? How do you uh, literally make not something from nothing? And we were rushing it, basically. And yeah, that's why we're taking time off now to make sure the scripts are right and we get the right cast for the films. Because one film festival is not gonna dictate the success of a film. Yeah, so. absolutely not. I mean, and that's, that's my biggest frustration in seeing, like after going to film school, you know, and being kind of forced, uh, Chapman especially, is that studio-oriented film school. You know, so after being forced into this like regiment you know, and knowing the proper way, um, I think that prepared me for, you know, doing independent film, but it certainly is frustrating when, you know, you give so much leeway to the things that you know 
you know, aren't necessarily, you know, going to vibe with that studio mentality. But one thing that you always have is time for the most part, unless you're going to die tomorrow, which I hope isn't the case. But, um, you know, nonetheless, you always have time. So you never want to rush. And I, you know, I see that too often in like younger people, a lot of young filmmakers, they, they want to they wanna get to the production point. They're, they're bored by writing the script and developing and pre-production, you know. But honestly, if you do all that correctly, your movie makes itself for the most part, you know. Um, any director will tell you and like just pass off like the work onto their cast because they've done the pre-production and casted right and done enough rehearsal mm -hmm. that like that's where their job was mainly. And at the end of the day, they're probably just tweaking if they're even there. Oh, uh, Woody Allen, you know. So um, I think you know that's the most important thing these days is you know people get too caught up in camera and production. They want to be around the lights and everything. And it's not necessarily like a Hollywood spectacle mentality, but it is like you want to be doing something. And it's hard to sit there in a chair and write and care about this thing that's going to take longer when you're sitting in a chair, you know, but it's the most important aspect. Yeah, I learned that with my sh the short film, which was technically my graduation film. Um, but I learned that lesson hard. Like, I thought the film was a failure because the script wasn't as good as it could have been. Um, it looks great. We did that. I, I was so obsessed with the look of everything, the special effects, and you know the lighting, the actors, but the script was the big thing. And I, that's what I learned from that. Do not do that again. Make when you make a film, just get it right before you even start doing production. Okay, so, what's next for both of you? What's next for Lorenzis Films as a whole? Um, um, a few things. I mean, you know, we have these these projects that you guys are doing. And that's, um, you know, going to be the next, you know, kind of shorts coming out of Arensis that's, you know, mutually, that we mutually worked with you guys on out of STC, or SC, SCT? STC. STC, I got it right the first time. Okay. Um, and then, you know, we don't want to mention exactly what it is quite yet, but um, we're working on developing Trishel's uh, first feature film that he wrote and directed, um, which, you know, uh, hopefully we'll be shooting by the beginning of next year. Um, but we're working on that. I just finished a feature script that I'm pursuing to shoot, hopefully right after uh, Trishel's feature. Um, we both have a few short films of our own, you know, in the lineup that are just, you know, kind of a mix of exercises for us just to keep things going and keep us, you know, working, but also projects that we've wanted to do for a little while. Um, I mean, what else? I'm I think the biggest thing is the, a new subdivision we want to start off, mm. which I want to call it Arensis Academy, uh, but the main aim is to have, I want to say the videography department, the side of Arensis Films. Arensis Films were like kind of focusing on narrative and those personal projects, but Arensis Academy is going to be more of a workhouse. And we're hoping to like have a lot of students, a mix of students and semi-professionals and professionals working on projects and literally being the number one place to go to in Sarasota or this side of Florida to get any video or film project done. You come to Arendtis Films and we'll put the stamp of quality on it. But any budget you have, you come to us and we'll get it done, basically. From a few hundred dollars up to several thousand. That's the next, this is this year's main goal, is to take this company and make it into something real in this area. And so at the same time as this department will be doing a lot of uh, the videography and kind of branching out from narratives, it's hopefully going to, you know, be an avenue for a lot of younger people in the area to be able to work on films, be able to work on projects, and get that experience that you don't necessarily get on a day-to-day -day in this specific area. You know, it's not Los Angeles, and even it's hard to get work out there sometimes too. Um, so this will be hopefully, you know, that way for them to be provided not only, you know, a small income from the projects they work on, but also the experience, literal you know, moving stuff and learning what the things that you use on set, like what's a C-stand, right? You're going to figure that out. I hope you guys know what C-stands are. Um, but nonetheless, you know, it's going to be that uh, kind of mix of both worlds. You know, it's going to be business. You guys are literally going to be, you guys, uh, you know, people who come in will be literally getting uh, experience in the real world, the profession of the film industry, the profession of the film industry. That sounds so weird. Um, yeah, learning how to invoice, learning how to chase a you know, all these kind of mm -hmm. business. Break some there, kneecaps you know. if you need to. Um, but, you know, at the same time, you'll be learning. You know, it'll be a, a school. It'll be kind of like uh, the ghetto film school of Braden. It'll be like a genuine internship for people. Like, that's, that's our goal. And we're, trying, we're literally going to be working that out in the next week or two. Um, but that's the goal for this year. So if people want to get in contact with you, where should they go? Uh 
or rentus.com. Just go to their website and you can pretty much see everything there. We're revamping the website for this new direction we're going to do. It's constantly being updated. You can also find us on Facebook at Arensis Films, yeah. uh, facebook.com slash Arensis Films. Um, you can also find Monty Comes Back on Facebook or on the web. Do a Google search or montycomesback.com. Well, I look forward to everything that's to come from both of you. Thank you both for joining me. Right. I'm Ariana Hillman, and this is the show.